Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. National Chief Roseanne Archibald's future as leader has dominated the AFN General Assembly. And that left more than 40 resolutions for this final day. Rob Smith leads off our coverage tonight. I am 100% committed to meeting with the regional chiefs. I need my phone back. The national chief was relieved on day one of the assembly, her suspension overturned. She hoped the assembly could come together and get some work done. There's a real healing path forward that has been charted by the chiefs through that resolution. They want to see us working together. By day three, however, tensions were high and the AFN's future still up in the air. A resolution calling for a forensic audit had not yet been debated. I have sent the information with respect to corruption to all chiefs across Canada. The national chief suspension sucked up too much oxygen, according to some delegates. Every time you decide to squabble amongst yourselves, you forget the children and the young people that you once swore to protect. We had the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. We talked about the $20 billion compensation. We're still, it's a $40 billion AIP. We haven't even had a conversation about that. And that's the most important thing that we need to talk about right now, not even on the agenda. I want to apologize to them for us sitting here for one and a half days arguing about millions of dollars while we sleep in $400 room hotels and we eat. And not, uh, not enough time on the issues that really matter. To number support. Two, please. This is not the way we conduct an... It's been adopted with 75% of the votes. Ego. In these times of uncertainty, distractions, and lack of leader in my community and to other communities, I want to apologize for this assembly. To our elders, our youth, and the next generation, we have failed you. But we can't waste any more time on this. Our people need us, and we are going home. Miigwech. Miigwech. The National Chief survived the week, her mandate intact, but it remains to be seen if the political will is there to follow through on the audit. Rob Smith, APTN National News, Vancouver. Thanks, Rob. Great work this week. Meanwhile, APTN News has learned that National Chief Roseanne Archibald is alleging the Assembly of First Nations Executive Committee hid an irregular financial transaction in which an employee transferred nearly $200,000 in AFN cash to their personal bank account in 2019. Our Brett Forrester just broke that story and you can find it on our website aptnnews.ca. Okay, continuing with our analysis of the Assembly of First Nations annual meeting, we're joined by Negan Sinclair, columnist with the Winnipeg Free Press, Kerry Benjo, editor of the Eagle Feather News in Regina, and our own Paul Barnsley, executive producer of APTN Investigates. Uh, Kerry, let's start with you. What's your take on this situation that's been unfolding with the infighting at the Assembly of First Nations? Um, as a female and with um Archibald being the first female chief, I have to question whether or not this would have happened if, to someone like Perry Bellegarde. Would, would the executive take this um, stronghold and have her have him suspended? And it um, sadly, it really reeked of um, patriarchy, um, a lack of respect, just from a female perspective and. Um, just from the fact that she is the first female chief and she's had to face this controversy within the first year of her um, her serving. And so I was, uh, I haven't been following a, um, AFN very, very much. I've been focused on um, regional coverage, but when this blew up, um, I'm on social media a lot. I, I read a lot of the comments and a lot of the anger coming from um, a lot of women a lot of young men who were feeling like this was just a stronghold and they were silencing her and i could understand that that sense of um at attack on on women um this came right after the roe versus wade um decision in the south and so there was this already this feeling of um of um I know a attack on females, attack on women. Together. And so this came right after that. And, so and I think everybody has been wrapped up in that. I know it's south of the border, but 
often what happens there trickles over here and um, that um, they call it the medicine line. We are so connected with people on the other side of the border that this this verdict also affects a lot of our family who are on the other side of the border. And so for me, it was just, it all came at once and it just felt like it was it was unfair and it was just not um, something that made me proud. Paul, you're on the ground at the AGA. Uh, what's the sense you've been getting out there from chiefs in assembly and others in attendance? Uh, there is definitely an element of, of what Kerry's talking about. Um, when I spoke to the national chief yesterday, uh, it's clearly um, something she feels and is not shy about talking about. Uh, what I'm getting now, and this is uh, unscientific, small sample size, but it seems to me there's a there's a split according to age. The younger chiefs are are supporting um, National Chief Archibald. The older chiefs are resisting her attempts to change the dynamic. Uh, now again, it might be people who have been around forever are the people who maybe are on that list of questionable contracts and they really don't want all that information to come out and they certainly don't want accountability if it should ever come to that. Although that's been watered down significantly from day one of this thing to the point now where there's been several versions of a resolution that we're expecting the chiefs to debate and the latest version um, uh, really uh, dulls the edge of any uh, attempt at major reform. Uh, it certainly does uh, seem much change from the original version. Uh, Nigon, you know, the national chief and, and others are are pushing for this internal and external investigation of the finances of the AFN. Do you think that should be a priority? Well, just to talk a little bit about what Carrie and Paul were talking about, I mean, certainly patriarchy is an issue, the treatment of women is an issue, but I also think that what needs to be considered is the fact that many of the regional chiefs have very deep ties with the Liberal Party, and uh, as we saw with under National Chief Perry Bellegarde, when you have a closeness to the federal governing party, in this case the Liberals, uh, money flows very quickly into the organization, and that money has gone somewhere, and if the National Chief has said that the forensic audit is needed, then certainly it needs to be addressed. If the very leader of the organization is receiving resistance from those within the organization who have sought or perhaps are overseeing the contracts which have gone out, uh, certainly there are a lot of smoke, and if there is smoke, one wonders if there's a fire. Uh, the question is really where does the AFN go from here? The structural changes that are necessary are evident. Uh, the fact that the national chief, the democratically elected national chief, voted by over 633 different chiefs in different ways, and, and whether you believe in democracy or not, that is the result of that election. Uh, the, the regional chiefs who don't really represent anyone other than their regional bodies, voted in by a few handfuls of chiefs. Um, can simply remove unjustly a national chief. That's a real problem in the organization and it suggests that there are systemic problems that are going to continue to plague this situation, plague this organization, and will, as was rightly criticized uh, on day two of the AGA by the Youth Council, uh, be involved in their own squabbles while youth are dying, while people are facing boiled water advisories. And if the AFN is to do what it's supposed to do, which is to advocate for First Nations, member First Nations chiefs and their issues within those First Nations, uh, it simply has not done so at this meeting. It really hasn't spent a whole bunch of time. And when the suspension vote was done, all of the chiefs tended to leave, or the majority anyways, of chiefs tended to leave. And, and that's a real sign that there is more fights yet to come, but then also structural changes that have to happen for the AFN to be relevant, because if they don't change, then more and more chiefs will simply just turn away. And I think the younger ones will sooner rather than later. Yes, there was a very uh, moving speeches from the Youth uh, Council yesterday. If you haven't seen those, check out our website. Uh, Carrie, you mentioned you know you haven't been paying much attention to the AFN, and, and with all this talk of reform, uh, has the organization reached the end of its relevancy? 
I think for a number of years, there has been a growing number of people who really question whether or not AFN is representing the average person, the average individual, um, someone like me, um, who lives in an urban setting. And so it's there's a lot of disconnect between AFN and Indigenous people living in urban settings. There is really um, a lack of um, of connection. And, and I see it growing. There's a lot of, I was out on um, Cody First Nation um, yesterday and speaking with the chief. Obviously he wasn't at the AF, at the assembly. And I know not, a number of chiefs who didn't bother attending the, the assembly, they said they send proxies. Mm -hmm. And that's a real concern about whether or not AFN is really meeting the needs, not only of individual people, but of, of the people they're representing, the, the individual chiefs in um, each province. And so it, it raises a lot of concern whether or not this is even, maybe it's time for change. Paul, this was uh, something we were hearing from speakers on the floor yesterday, feeling like, you know, they spent a lot of money to come out to Vancouver to this thing and not much was being accomplished. They, they felt like it was almost a waste of time. Do you, what are you hearing from people there about where the AFN goes? Uh, it's interesting. We were sitting on the riser at the back of the room uh, that's reserved for the media. Uh, uh, I was sitting with Jorge Barrera, former APTNer who's now at CBC, and the, between the two of us, we've been covering the AFN for a long time. And I had three separate elders um, come up to me and, and sort of joke about how there's, considering how the expectations were raised coming into this, that there may be some uh, correcting uh, of some of the major faults in the organization it, it's turned into a, it sort of reminds me of the old money python sketch where you had them uh, the narrator go and suddenly duh, 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 nothing happened because nothing's been happening really for day two and day three Negan, uh, very briefly here, uh, if you want to react to that, but also that, you know, you've written about the disrespect and pettiness that was shown to the national chief by the regional chiefs. Uh, what, if any, fallout do you see for the regional chiefs who had voted to suspend the national chief? Uh, none. I don't see any punishment or any sort of consequence happening for the regional chiefs. Uh, the AFN really has a problem. Uh, when there's a singer, singular issue, like for instance during the 1985, 80s, 1980s constitutional debates, even during the time of the Royal uh, Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, or during the struggles for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, when the AFN has a single issue to bring chiefs together to rally for, and particularly to advocate against the federal government on a policy, uh, the AFN tends to become more unified. Uh, think of the days, for example, even of Stephen Harper and how how the AFN at that time was quite unified, um, even though it had a situation involving National Chief Atlio of sort of being called out for not being able to bring Stephen Harper to the table. Um, when it, recently, when uh, Perry Belgard is on board with the uh, with Justin Trudeau, it tends to be uh, an AFN that tends to work a bit more. Uh, fluidly. At the moment, you have a national chief who's battling with the regional chiefs on what are power control issues because the regional chiefs want to bring uh, program dollars, delivery services. That's me talking in a glass half uh, full way of seeing that the regional chiefs are trying to advocate for the organization to go regionally, whereas the national chief is trying to have, make a much more bigger structural issue within the organization. So that's going to be a tension. Um, and so I think the regional chiefs are going to probably go back to their provincial organizations. They're probably going to get maybe admonished a bit for their behavior for this gathering, for not having done much work or held up much work. But at the same time, people are going to look at the national chief and say, how is she being able to bring the regions on her side moving forward into the future? And I think there's a real critical juncture here. The next year of uh, National Chief Roseanne Archibald's reign as national chief is really going to be a telling sign of whether there's going to be more fights or whether the AFN is going to continue to try to struggle between a national vision and regional visions. Indeed. Uh, sadly, uh, we have uh, run out of time here. wish we could go for like an hour here. But uh, 
Uh, Nigon, Kerry, Paul, appreciate you all taking some time to uh, speak about this with us. Yeah, miigwech. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dennis. Time now for a quick break. Coming up, we'll continue our joint investigation with Global News into foster care homes in Ontario. Stick around. Welcome back. All week long, we've been taking you inside the operations of an Ontario company, which for decades ran foster care and group homes for vulnerable youth, and which still operates three group homes. It's called Connor Homes, a private company run by the Connor family. The profits from the kids in its care with the help of taxpayer money. The Ontario government allows this, much like most other provinces, but it's how Connor Holmes handled that money that has sparked criticism and how little, some say, was left for the kids it was meant to serve. Carolyn Jarvis reports in a Global News, APTN News investigation. The finances of Connor Holmes and its affiliate businesses are a dizzying maze. Numbered companies layered upon numbered companies, all owned by members of the Connor family. Bob at the top his son Sean running the day-to-day -day operations. Connor Homes states its foster care and group homes help kids in need. But follow the money and you'll see some of the Connors also help themselves. The money that exchanges hands is huge. There are some people getting very, very rich. In 2013, Sean agreed in family court for his divorce that he earned an estimated $200,000 a year from his foster care company. His ex-wife also alleging he engaged in extremely aggressive accounting techniques. 
listing payments for a boat and two trailers similar to these as corporate expenses. If we look at the financial statements from 2008. We asked two independent forensic accountants to review the divorce file, including Matt McGuire. I would not expect in this line of business that you would be expensing a boat and recreational trailers. Sean denies the allegations, saying the trailers were indeed business expenses used in lieu of hotel rooms, while other items may not have actually been claimed by his accountant. It smells funny. According to a list of corporate expenses he prepared for his accountant, Sean also spent nearly $67,000 on hotels, restaurants and entertainment from 2007 to 2009. He defends it was for rewarding foster parents and workers and that he had to promote his company to government agencies. But Sean didn't have any government contracts. His sole client was his father's company. Here's how it works. Bob Connor is the president and co-owner of a numbered company known as Connor Homes, which until recently was licensed as a foster care agency and which still runs three group homes. Sean operates a second numbered company, which acted as a middleman between his father and some of the foster parents who took in kids. What sorts of things do you need to run a business where all you do is push a contract to somebody else, right? Not a boat. According to financial data from 2018, foster care agencies in Ontario, like Connor Homes, received an average of $173 a day per child from children's aid societies, while Connor Homes paid foster parents $58 per day for each child, as stated in a contract from that same year. There's a whole bunch of people getting in the middle, taking a cut. That's right. We tried to speak with Bob and Sean Connor. Hello. I'm looking for Bob. I'll find out if he wants to. Thanks. But despite multiple attempts to reach them. He's saying no, but thank you very much. They declined to appear on camera. In a statement, Sean Connor said the parent company, Connor Homes, had its foster care funding reviewed and audited annually. So this is a real problem. Experts say this is but an example of what happens when the province allows profit to be a driver instead of quality of care. Take the profit out of the system. It would render care a social process as opposed to an economic process. Take the price tag of kids. Carolyn Jarvis for APTN National News. You can read and watch the entire four-part series into Connor Holmes over on our website, aptnnews.ca. Time to step aside for another quick break, but stick around. There's more to come.
Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. This one of a beautiful sunset over the calm waters of Nisachewiasic Cree Nation's Footprint Lake. Great shot shared by Myrna Dumas. You can send your pic to share at aptn.ca. Be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, 23 in Halifax, 19 and cloudy in St. John's. Cloudy in 15 for Kujuwak, rain in Nain and a high of 10. 26 with showers in Montreal, 18 and rain in Shibugamu. 22 under the sun for Sault Ste. Marie, showers in 22 in North Bay. Sunny in 22 in Thunder Bay, sunny and 25 in Sioux Lookout. 27 for God's Lake, Norway House, Thompson and Churchill. Sunny and 27 for Winnipeg, Dauphin and Barron's River. Cloudy and 25 in Regina, showers and 25 in Saskatoon. 23 with rain in Meadow Lake, showers and 25 in La Ronge. Over in Northern Alberta, 23 with showers in Fort McMurray and Grand Prairie. 25 with rain in Edmonton, 29 and showers for Lethbridge. 21 in rain in Vancouver, cloudy and 21 for Victoria. 19 in Prince George, Smithers, and East Lake. 27 with rain in Old Crow, 24 and showers for Whitehorse. Rain in 23 for Yellowknife, 31 with rain in Norman Wells. 20 in Saks Harbor, showers in 30 for Anuvik. 22 in Cambridge Bay, 25 in Baker Lake. 12 with rain in Resolute, 25 in Joe Haven. For the first time in the Yukon, a piece of First Nations artwork was installed at the courthouse in Whitehorse. The piece is a painting titled Forget Me Not by Car Cross Tagish First Nation artist Violet Gatsonby. The artwork is part of a series to make the territory's judicial system more inclusive. Gatsonby says the painting represents the resilience of Indigenous peoples. This piece is to represent the strength and the growth and I made the flowers abundant to show that out of all the hardships we're growing back. There's new growth and we won't forget. Looks beautiful. Now that is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. For more on anything you've seen here in that breaking news story on the allegations of an irregular financial transaction at the Assembly of First Nations, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you back here tomorrow.